We all need someone to care about us. And not just in the big grand ways, in the big grand moments, but also in the tough little things of everyday life. I'll ask you the same question I ask the kids. Have you ever been sick with a fever? I'm not talking about some major disease that might kill you or ruin your quality of life, just a run-of-the-mill cold or stomach bug. Something you know that when you get it, if you rest and take enough time, it'll heal itself. Did someone take care of you when you were sick like that? Or were you alone? Or maybe you've had a time where someone did take care of you and a time where there wasn't anybody around. We don't like to admit it because we're taught to downplay the thought, but it does make a big difference to us, doesn't it, when someone is there to take care of you, even with the small things. Well, our gospel reading today in Mark 1 beautifully demonstrates that we have a Lord and Savior who is at the same time Lord of all creation, but also one who takes care of the little things. He doesn't just show up on the big grand stage, but also in the little tough things we deal with in our day-to-day life. So what is the little thing that Jesus takes care of in Mark chapter 1? Well, it's a fever. Simon's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. She's not possessed by an unclean spirit or nearing death or even dealing with some chronic incurable condition. She just has a fever. Now, Granted, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about the fever, but I think that's on purpose. I think if you're a witness to an event like this and you record it the way that it's recorded in Mark, it wasn't like she was on her way to developing some more serious condition. It was just a fever. And our temptation is to make it more than it is because it seems odd to us that Jesus who came to earth to save the entire world would bother with a fever. We usually, when we think of the miracles of Jesus, I bet you this isn't the first one that comes to your mind. We think of His extravagant miracles where He raises the widow's son from the dead or Jairus' daughter or helping somebody who's been crippled their whole life walk for the very first time or, of course, when He casts out demons because That's not something that a little bit of time and rest will fix. So, of course, you need Jesus to intervene. But here, in Mark chapter 1, there's really nothing that indicates Simon's mother-in-law really needs Jesus to heal her from her fever. It just seems like He does. Now, What does she do with her newfound health? It says that she gets up and serves them dinner. Because we might retroactively try to make sense of this action of Jesus by saying, well, she went on to cure cancer or develop some modern technology that really helps a ton of people. That's really why Jesus bothered to do this. But that's not the case. The text simply says that she began to serve them. Have you ever deferred to God or one of His representatives like a pastor by saying something like this, oh, don't bother with this. It's really not that important. I'm sure God has many more important things to do than tend to little old me or this little issue that I'm having. Now, I know some of you have because you've said it to me. You said, oh, pastor, don't bother with this. I'm sure there's more important things for you to be doing. It's a pretty common phrase. I think if you asked any pastor, have you ever heard someone say this, they would all unanimously say yes. And most people, I think, mean well when they say that. But I would encourage you to stop saying it because it turns out God doesn't have more important things to do. 
You see, God isn't like us, and I think this stems from maybe a misunderstanding. When we imagine God, we tend to imagine Him something like ourselves, where if I go off someplace and help someone, I can't be somewhere else, or that if I give of myself, there's really only so much I can give until I can't give anymore. But God isn't like us. He is eternal. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present. When I asked the kids, where would we find Jesus if we looked for Him, all their answers pointed to the singular truth of everywhere. So just in that one example, we can see that He isn't like us. If I go somewhere, it means I'm not somewhere else. But it's not so with God. Now, you might be wondering later on in the text, Jesus is kind of a mix of this. Because a bunch of people are looking for him, and he says, let's keep going. But we'll make sense of that in a moment. Because after he heals Simon's mother-in-law, he's been teaching in the synagogue. Remember last week, people were amazed at the authority with which he taught. He didn't have to refer to some other authority. He just spoke as the Son of God himself, and he cast out a demon. So word got around, and people were bringing all of those they knew to be healed by Jesus, whether it was of some disease or whether it was possession by an unclean spirit. And does Jesus send them away? Of course He doesn't. I don't know if you've watched the, the show The Chosen, but there's a scene, I can't remember if it's in the first season or the second, where this happens. A bunch of people show up who are in need of Jesus, and they do a good job in The Chosen of sort of portraying the disciples not understanding the mission of Jesus, and that they're very impatient with how many people He sees and helps. I mean, Jesus is the Messiah. He has more important things to do than deal with all of these randos coming with all of their problems. We've got to get to the bigger stage. We've got to reach more people. We've got to do the greater good. And yet, the way they depict the scene in The Chosen is Jesus heals of them until He can't anymore, and He goes to rest. Well, He does the same thing here. He doesn't send these people away. He says, the text says that He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And then He goes to bed. The next morning, he does something interesting. He wakes up early and departs to be alone while it's still dark and pray to the Father. You see, the intimacy of the relationship with God that we now have in Jesus stems from his intimacy with the Father. Because when we are called to be his own, we are brought into the family of God, and now we can also address God as our heavenly Father. But here's the tricky part, one of those annoying Christian paradoxes of both and, and now and not yet, and in the world but not of the world, is Jesus is here for you specifically, but not just you. He also has the bigger mission from God. Now, the trick is that He isn't really taken from you to accomplish the bigger mission of God because the bigger mission of God is for you. I sounded a bit like Paul there, I think, when you read one of those passages and you get to the end and you're like, what did he say? But it really is that way because we're dealing with a God who isn't like us, who isn't limited in the ways that we are. Let me read this section of our gospel to illustrate that. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Well, no, duh, why wouldn't they be? He just healed a bunch of people of diseases and cast out demons. He's teaching with authority. Everybody wants Jesus. But Jesus' response here is sort of funny in an ironic way. And it catches you off guard. If you're just tracking with the story, this seems to depart from the narrative so far. And he said to them, everybody's looking for you, Jesus. And he said to them, let's go. 
Let us go on. Now, I think by maybe some of our definitions of evangelism, we would think that Jesus is not making the right choice here. You have people that want to see you. Shouldn't you go to them? But he says, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. So we get this snapshot of what the bigger mission is about with the intimacy of Simon's home and the healing of his mother-in-law's fever and the attention that Jesus gives to these individuals who aren't even coming to him with eternally significant problems. But he's healing them of their earthly discomforts and diseases. That's why he has to go. The bigger mission is to bring the intimacy of the Heavenly Father's love and care for the individual, for you, to everyone who believes in the entire world. The movement of our text illustrates this reality. Let's follow the movement because this is the way Jesus often works in our lives. So we start out with Jesus teaching in the synagogue, a bit like church, right? Then He goes home with the people who hear His teaching. That's true for you too, isn't it? When you leave here today, you don't leave Jesus behind. He goes with you when you go home. And then the people who Jesus goes with, they tell Jesus about the people that they care for who need His help. So when they get to Simon's house, they just tell Jesus about Simon's mother-in-law. Notice they don't say, Jesus, can you heal her? They simply say, this is my mother-in-law, she has a fever. Then He helps them. Then He helps the people we bring into His attention that we know. Now, word is getting around about these things that Jesus is doing, and more people come to see Him. And maybe for good reasons, maybe for not good reasons. Maybe they're just there to get what they think they need and be on their way. But it is understandable why they would come, both from the temporal understanding of, well, He apparently can heal people, right? I mean, even now, if somebody claims to heal and there's some sort of credible story about it, it is surprising the number of people that will flock to that despite the fact that most of us think that that's not really a thing. But even more so, the word which Jesus is preaching is the best news there is. Because Jesus is here to tell us that the all-powerful God of the universe who sustains all of creation with the word of His power comes to you, cares about you, and not only about you in an existential sense, but even all the little troubles and travails of your life. I mean, isn't that great news? What a being to have in your corner. No wonder it is said in the Scriptures, if God is for us, who can be against us? And in some ways, we naturally understand the intimacy of this relationship we now have with God, like the times where we, like Jesus, go off to pray by ourselves. And our culture, our church culture in the West, has done a good job of emphasizing this personal relationship with God, because it is true. He desires it of you, and He creates it for you and in you. Yet, I think that sometimes we miss an aspect of that truth. We don't often think about how He has the same kind of relationship with everyone who believes in Him. Look around the room this morning. Go ahead, look around. Look at the faces around you, the same intimate, loving relationship of the Heavenly Father that you share, He has given to them as well. You see, Jesus doesn't belong to us. We'd like to think so. 
Why do you think Simon and those who were with him went to find Jesus? Because everybody wanted him to stay. I mean, look what he does. And if we're honest at times, I think we do the same. We like to just keep Jesus for ourselves. But he doesn't belong to us, which is what explains his curious response to everyone calling out for him to say, everyone's looking for you, Jesus, but let us go on. And this is the final movement of the text. You see, it went from the synagogue into the intimacy of the home and then spills out into the town, and now it goes even further. From the gathering of people who have all been known and healed by Jesus out into the surrounding region, and then eventually when we get to the end of the Gospels, into the whole world. It's beautiful, isn't it? The closeness of our God that we have a God who cares about even our little needs and hurts, that stays far longer to help out lesser people than we would, and yet at the same time, He is infinitely loving and infinitely vast, and the scope of His mission is ambitious beyond belief. It includes every single person right now and in the future and in the past. There he is again, not being like us, not limited in all the ways that we are. You see, when he goes on to other places, he can still be with us here and is still with us here. Sometimes I think about how we say that Jesus is really physically present in the body and blood when we celebrate the sacrament. But do you know how many churches are celebrating that today? How big is the body and blood of Jesus? It turns out bigger than anything in the world, overflowing and never-ending because it's for all people all the time. This is why when we ask for help for our small cares and tell them about our loved one's struggles, they don't have to be monumental for Him to care, nor for us to believe that He will be present there and He will help heal even the little things. Maybe a good way to say it is that God is intimate and infinite. He is eternal. He can share Himself with all and not run out. So let's follow along with the movement of Jesus in our text today. Let us go on from this place following Jesus where He goes. He intends to inform the surrounding area and then the world that their Heavenly Father loves them. For He intends, despite the infinite scope of His mission, which He has now given to us, what's the point of that mission? To bring the intimacy and closeness of God in Jesus to all people who believe in Him. As He says, for that is why he came out. In the name of Jesus, amen.